So now we have about um, just under 30 minutes for questions and uh, if people want to make their way to the mics. Um, as moderator prerogative, I have a couple I've jotted down uh, during the presentations. Um, one for uh, Celia. So how are the various uh, New York City healthcare sectors um, that you described, I think four categories, interlinked on climate health preparedness and response other than hurricane or weather related um, scenarios? Uh, you mentioned communication, unified response, and maybe are there exercises between, so other than weather related? Yeah, so I would be completely remiss if I talked about our healthcare preparedness efforts without talking about healthcare coalitions, and that's a really been a really important initiative nationally. Um, in New York City, we have um, well, we have a lot of different types of healthcare coalitions, and we have about 23 independent coalitions that sort of come together as the New York City Healthcare Coalition, a coalition of coalitions, and through that coalition pretty much all of the sectors are represented to varying degrees. Um, so we have been increasingly trying to work across the sectors to have them do planning and exercising and training together. Um, and as we've done that, we've also had a lot of success in the last couple of years bringing city agencies in to work with our healthcare partners as part of exercises. So um, last year when our health department did a functional exercise about a cyber attack, we made sure that um, a couple of representatives from large healthcare systems were participating in the planning of it with us to make it more realistic for the health department. And we had them also participate as observers in the exercise. So um, we're moving towards even further, like having bigger roles for the healthcare system in our own health department exercises, and also um, bringing the fire department and other uh, agency partners in too. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience, please. I had to turn that. Yeah. Am I good now? There we go. Good. Thank you for your presentation. Terry Allen from the Calgary County Health Department in Greater Cleveland and a member of the Roundtable. Uh, I have a question for Kristen around, uh, I appreciated the focus on equity that Baltimore brings to the discussion. I think it's fantastic work. The uh, uh, very interesting approach you're taking around incorporating to the all hazards response plan. Uh, interested in your journey in working with emergency management uh, and uh, how, how that developed over time. I think that's a that makes perfect sense to me in terms of the approach. Uh, and I think many communities could emulate that approach. So if you could talk a bit about that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, I have a whole other hour long presentation on that if you want it sometime. Uh, yeah, so that was um, something that uh, we started in 2012. Um, and the reason that we did it is an all hazard mitigation plan is a requirement uh, in order to be eligible for pre disaster mitigation funding. Um, every municipality has to do it and be updated every five years. Um, in that, the structure of creating a plan is really to assess your hazards, uh, go through vulnerability based on historic hazards, and then identify how you're going to mitigate those hazards. And we said, well, this you know, methodology is almost exactly what you would do for a climate adaptation plan. Uh, why don't we start to be proactive rather than reactive uh, because we keep on getting hit with these events. Um, so we went to our Maryland Emergency Management Agency uh, representatives and our FEMA Region 3 representatives and actually asked them, uh, would you be up for us doing this? Um, and we're going to kind of push back and say this is uh, an approach we want to take. Uh, we got a lot of support. We were really lucky to have some good support at both the state and the um, uh, federal level at the time. Uh, and so now climate change is actually integrated into our plan 100% and every action that's within that plan is actually um, thinking about climate scenarios and has allowed us to integrate um, climate and climate change into our capital improvements process. Um, as well as some other big initiatives that I just didn't have enough time to talk about, but things related to our floodplain management. So this has been a big connection with the National Flood Insurance Program, um, the Community Rating System Program, and other things like that that have benefited emergency managers because we're reducing risk uh, for the bigger events uh, that we seem to be seeing more often. Thank you. Question over here. Better? Better. Excellent. Thank you very much for those presentations, all fantastic examples of really good programs. Uh, how do you guys find the funding for those things? Do you find it's a struggle when you're talking with other policy leaders of 
encouraging these sorts of programs versus competing priorities? Um, so the programs that I am involved with are primarily funded by CDC and ASPR, the FEP and the HPP program. We also have some of very tiny amount of city tax levy funding. Um, we also have uh, some other funding from other CDC sources related to epidemiology and um, capacity building. Um, we're always trying to educate people on how important our programs are. Um, we have, we have, the New York City's um, FEP program released a couple of stories last year about some of the impacts that our FEP programming has had, and we're gonna do something similar with the HPP program in the next couple of months. So yes, we're always trying to, it's not just with funders, but also with some of the healthcare leadership that we're really trying to make them understand what the value is of them working with the health department and other city agencies. Uh, for our programs, um, anything related to your basic planning, uh, we've been able to secure uh, state Department of Natural Resources dollars through NOAA programs, specifically um, uh, coastal programs. Uh, but the reality is um, the really cool stuff we get to do and the things that are outreach are all um, philanthropy. And we have a really amazing foundation in Maryland um, that funds a lot of the work in the state. Unfortunately, they're sunsetting, so we're all gonna cry real soon. Uh, but they are what allows us to do um, food and things like turtle and different messaging and every story counts and communications and the things I think that really make a big difference. Um, unfortunately, those aren't usually part of any sort of federal or state grant we're eligible for. And for New Hampshire, it's definitely um, the Centers for Disease Control that provides most of the money, the seed money to get this going. Um, without a doubt, it's also the supporters in Congress and the administration who believe in this work and want to get it done. And thirdly, when we go into these communities, you know, we come in with $20,000 or something and a lot of support, but without the people in the community who wanted to engage and gave in-kind time and worked extra hours, it wouldn't happen either. So you have to find in the community people that want to do it and feel like they share your values. Great, thank you. Jonathan? Uh, Jonathan Patz. Uh, Kristen, you didn't ask who was born and raised in Baltimore. <laughs> so that's me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to ask you and maybe to the others as well, you had just talked about integrating disaster planning and preparedness and climate change adaptation. And I'm wondering if in working with your communities, if you've got a few headliners or top top uh, initiatives that are actually giving you uh, a win-win and optimizing both preparedness and at the same time uh, adaptive capacity. One example would be green roofs to reduce the urban heat island that also could, you could grow food, you can you know, reduce rainfall runoff. Are there a couple of these things working and doing your active listening with these communities that are actually paying off uh, and giving you additional um, benefits you hadn't thought of before. Yeah, so you had a couple questions there. Uh, the first one about um, integrating climate change into hazard planning or, or hazard mitigation planning. Um, I think I mentioned it before, but it's a, it's a very natural um, overlap because of the methodology for both being um, very similar and also uh, just with the science changing continuously and the hazards uh, we're seeing more frequently, uh, the more we're updating those documents and, and planning for higher scenarios, the better. So um, we're actually gonna be bringing our climate mitigation and climate adaptation plan together into our hazard, all hazard plan at this point because uh, we can't just do actions on mitigation anymore. They have to have co-benefits co for adaptation. Um, and so when you're talking about examples for us, um, some of the bigger things we've seen is work with um, the Baltimore Energy Challenge around behavior change on, on energy use and um, solar. We have a really um, amazing uh, piece of work done with um, the Waterfront Partnership where they put in the water wheel, which is a solar powered uh, water wheel called Mr. Trash Wheel, who also um, collects trash that comes from the Jones Falls when we have a massive flood. Um, and so it helps keep the inner harbor cleaner. It helps with adaptation as far as keeping um, thing clogging agents out of the harbor and, and impacting boats, but also is solar panel. So it gives us a lot of opportunities for education. Um, green infrastructure obviously is an amazing opportunity and a lot 
lot of ways, but for us, um, we don't have the same type of funding and investment uh, that places like uh, New York are blessed with or Philadelphia. Um, so some of the things we're trying to do is actually a, a lot of change with our floodplain code, and um, that's been a really big uh, opportunity, and I'm happy to talk to you about that in more detail, but it gets really technical based on free board and um, extending the extent, uh, but we've seen a lot of co-benefits there in education with uh, real estate community, insurance community, lowering insurance rates by 25% for members of our community, so there's been a lot of stuff in, in that area. Next question, please. Thanks. Uh, this is Mark Garavich. I'm at the Department of Population Health at NYU uh, School of Medicine. And so as a, a New Yorker, there's a question uh, for Celia, but thinking broadly, you mentioned, I think, that uh, about 6,000 persons were evacuated in one way or another. Is that right? Um, yeah, so that's the city health department's yeah. count of patients that were evacuated, but it's really counting essentially from the time that the evacuation was ordered, so right. patients that were quickly discharged or transferred in before the evacuation order came wouldn't be counted in that right number. so my so my question is um, do we know uh, longitudinally uh, do we have data on the impact of that very uh, sharp disruption uh, on such a large number of uh, patients who were evacuated from a variety of kinds of facilities do we know the impact on mortality and uh, and and other outcomes over time from that has that been looked at you know not to my knowledge. So, and I don't. We didn't have like a cohort study to follow people mm -hmm. to find out what happened to them afterward. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Sandy Magnin from the Population Health Roundtable. So, as I was listening uh, to all of you, and particularly uh, to you from New York, um, thinking about in healthcare, we have something called with the electronic health record alert fatigue where there's just, you know, there's so many alerts, so forth. Is there something, will there be with increasing disasters, increasing storms, kind of disaster fatigue? And, and how will we work with communities around that? Uh, and, and any experience or thoughts you have about that? Uh, well, I was telling someone recently that since I joined the health department in 2014, our, our own incident command system was activated for 760 days straight, so I know that people in our agency have disaster response fatigue, uh, myself included. Um, you know, I, uh, there's benefits of, like I explained with the Irene and Sandy example, there are sometimes benefits to having frequent emergencies because you practice your response and you can improve it. Um, but at the same time, you sometimes take away the wrong lessons or, you know, there's the uh, phenomenon of like the boy who cried wolf. Oh, is this going to be another, you know, activation? And um, I have a feeling people are probably feeling that back in New York City now as we're preparing for another big storm that's going to possibly come tomorrow. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't get a sense from our healthcare system partners like how, how that is playing out throughout all of the levels of their organizations. But I know from our perspective, um, yes, we're. All, we're, we're contemplating a future where we're activated more continuously and trying to figure out how to adapt our systems to meet that challenge. Sure. Um, we're, we're working with the National Weather Service in, in northern New England around that exact issue because when we said we've got all this new public health data that shows moderate heat can impact people as much as extreme heat, they said, so how many, how is that going to change the number of alerts we do per year? And now I think it was, we're, we're relatively protected by a, a temperate environment in northern New England where it doesn't get that hot. But we were at, uh, I think it was one or two alerts per, day, per year where it was going to be over 100 degrees. And they said, we don't want it to go a lot higher. Um, and I think we're, our estimates said that if we bring it down to 95, it might go to four to eight alerts per year. But that's a real concern. And then I say to myself, well, what about all the, the meteorologists? It seems like every day in the summertime or otherwise, they're exciting people about something else is going out. Why is it that heat stress is such a worry to the National Weather Service that people are going to get fatigued? People are getting hit with a lot all the time, and I want to keep it reasonable. But I, I think there's maybe some over-concern there or misplaced. So, um, 
I think what we're trying to do is, is uh, look at different audiences with, with that and, and really think strategically about um, everybody's different role. Um, with certain audiences that we know are, are going to be extremely vulnerable, so ones in our floodplains uh, that already have had massive impacts, um, we have established with them kind of a rule to evacuate no matter what because of the flash flooding that can happen. Uh, you know, there could be a 20-foot rise in less than an hour in, in some of these areas. We have some of the most flood-prone waterways in the country. So. Um, with them, they've been flooded out enough that the businesses actually listen. We get the cars out of the parking lots. So that's that's one audience. And I think it's different um, with residents. And, and that's why we're trying to, with the resiliency hubs, we're trying to actually make them fun locations that people go already um, so that it's fun to maybe go to your resiliency hub and spend time. There's games. That's actually one of the things we're ordering for each of the sites. There are games or ways to keep people engaged and have a good time. Um, for our waterfront properties uh, that are going to be sort of susceptible to the storm surge, um, we don't have that as often as, let's say, southern Florida. So when we do ask the building owners to put up gates or get prepared, um, everybody's keeping a good eye on it. Uh, we had Hurricane Isabel in 2003 that had a, a storm surge not quite like Sandy, but definitely impacted the Inner Harbor badly and, and is still in people's minds. Um, so each audience is a little bit different and the level of uh, expectation is different, but I think we're trying to approach it at least with residents in a way that these can be fun locations to go or we can make preparedness and you know getting ready more fun, um, whereas for some folks it has to happen all the time regardless of whether or not the waters rise that fast. Let's go here and then over here, please. Uh, I'm Ray Baxter. I'm a former member of the Roundtable. Uh, once was public hospital director in New York and public health director in San Francisco. My question is about scaling. Um, and I've been listening all through the program today to each project and each effort. And we've gone through a bit of a a, a, an escalation to the point where we're now talking about very comprehensive kind of planning approaches, which each of you in, in some ways embodies. What I'd like to ask you is to what extent are you scaling something that someone else already did and demonstrating that can be brought to a much bigger level? And then to the next level, what is it going to take to scale the kind of ingredients that are going into your success in the planning and, and preparedness process to a regional, state, or national level? All right. <laughs> Um, as, as far as scaling uh, data for us is the way that we're utilizing a lot of the big scaling or, or larger information and trying to bring it down. Um, things that are coming from the National Plan on Climate Change, the National Climate Assessment, um, what is happening with a lot of the bigger health data. In fact, I, I watched the event in Atlanta, even though health is not my area of expertise, um, all day long and actually found access to certain documents that we're now using on our social media uh, because they already exist. And so there are great opportunities for us to make connections. Um, so. Some of it's communication, some of it I think is data and information that we're, we're kind of scaling down in a way. Um, but I do think a regional approach is exactly right. Uh, that's what's necessary. You have regions that are facing the same impacts and, and tend to same, uh, share the same history in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the intentionally uh, sort of segregated history that we have in Baltimore. In Milwaukee is also one of the most segregated cities in the country. We, have, we share that um, unfortunate uh, history. And so there's ways to um, learn about what each region, and I think it's actually finding the trusted contacts in those areas who know where to get the best information, what toolkits are most useful, um, and um, having those trusted experts who understand the differences between an Annapolis, a Baltimore, a DC, a Philadelphia, um, and sort of the neat, unique characteristics, but also the similarities and being able to help with translation of information. Um, from sort of the scientific community and, and academic community and also being able to help identify opportunities for integration into um, your top seven type of plans, your comprehensive plan, your hazard mitigation plan, et cetera. So I, I don't know if that answers your question all the way, but scaling with data is one way, communications, and then I think it's also just the regional approach you're right on. Oh, um, so. 
Uh, the healthcare programs that I'm referencing, we've been working with healthcare system in New York City since the beginning of the bioterrorism programs funded by CDC and the HPP program in the early 2000s. Um, a lot of that work was really focused on hospitals in the acute care sector. And we had some successes there, and we've really built strong relationships with the emergency managers and all of our hospitals within New York City. Um, it's in the recent years since Sandy that we've tried to up expand that and really reach a lot of other new parts of the healthcare sector that we're not working with. Um, we're doing a lot better with long-term care, as I mentioned. Um, we haven't really got our arms around how we work with the urgent care sector, also rapidly growing and a little bit hard to um, enumerate uh, in New York City. And um, home-based care, which is also uh, you know, one of the things that I'm most worried about in terms of our vulnerability for future, um, especially coastal storms, but other types of emergencies as well. So I think in terms of your question about how to scale it up more, it's strengthening more of those connections between the sectors within our city, but then also starting to you know, bring that to our regional partners in you know, New York State, New Jersey, and, other, um, and the rest of the area. That's a great question, and the, the part of the question I heard you say was, how do you make sure it hasn't been done before, and this isn't a waste, and in this, it's a great conservative question, right? How do we ensure that the textiles we use and the things we do in state government aren't a waste? And I think for the scaling part, one of the things when I sh we showed the BRACE framework, like that intervention phase, that intervention assessment phase, is where we're supposed to go in and discover and find out who's done it before and if they've done it with a similar population to us so we don't reproduce it. Let's gather the good work that's been done already before we jump forward and put it to work. I do want to make one comment on that too is um, please, if anybody is planning on making more toolkits for local governments, don't. There, there is no more toolkits needed. I was just at a meeting last week with NOAA um, and APA, and in the room of the 40 people that were there, um, I was the only local government person, and, and we had a list of maybe 50 toolkits, that, um, and there were overlaps with the green infrastructure toolkits. I, no more toolkits are needed. We actually need somebody to identify what toolkits actually work. That's a great so we're, we're running down on time here. Uh, we have enough time for just two more questions, if they're quick, please. Go ahead. Bob Griss with the Institute of Social Medicine and Community Health. Uh, my question is similar to the one on scaling, but it is whether the communities in which you are doing this preparedness, emergency preparedness, are more likely to be trying to also uh, do healthcare coordination among the various components of the healthcare delivery system. In other words, I am a health planner who wished everybody got sick at the same time. And that's sort of what your emergency situation creates. And you're able to plan for an emergency where that's happening, but I'm wondering if there are any, any consequences of this planning process, implications of this planning process that can lead to more effective health care, community health planning efforts that are different from the ones that we are dealing with in our fragmented delivery system. Sue, you want to tackle that? Yeah, so <laughs> I would love to. Um, so <laughs> I think, so I love your question, and I think it, it a little bit goes both ways, right? So in the healthcare system, we're observing a period of time where there's lots of consolidation, and there's lots of change in the healthcare delivery system that's doing a lot of this connection between acute care and non-acute care, home-based care, um, having taking care of more people at lower levels of care. So that is impacting how hospitals especially think about their emergency management, or at least it should be changing how they think about their emergency management programs. At the same time, um, you know, um, and I should just also mention that I am a social medicine trainee from the residency program in social medicine at Montefiore, so I understand where your question is coming from. I hope that we can connect the preparedness work that we do in the healthcare system to those day-to-day -day service delivery elements, because it's my belief that if we are planning for things that are only going to be pulled out during an emergency, we're first of all losing an opportunity to improve the healthcare system that really needs a lot of improvement, um, but we're also 
designing systems that are not likely to work in an emergency because they're not being used day to day. So one example that I didn't get a lot of time to um, talk directly about in my uh, remarks is the uh, project with the Ho hospital association to develop improved patient transfer forms. Um, we sat down with a really broad group of stakeholders across New York City from different healthcare systems, transfer centers, physicians, nurses, emergency managers, and agreed on a set of fields that are really necessary to have like all the critical information that you would need to take care of a patient that's rapidly being transferred to you during an emergency, but we've disseminated that to all the hospitals and asked them to implement it for their day-to-day -day transfer forms so that we make the day-to-day -day transfers go more smoothly. Um, and, we've, and some of the hospital systems have started uh, working with their, emerge, their uh, electronic health record vendors to make it so that it's like push a button and those fields get pulled from the electronic health record. So now um, we, you know, when, once that gets implemented across the city, we would have a system where all of the hospitals are using the same information to transfer patients. So they're making each transfer safer um, and they're also doing it more rapidly. So also improving their throughput, which is a really important metric for the hospital. So we're hoping that that's one of these like win-wins. Um, but I want to see our preparedness programming more focused on those day-to-day -day improvements and also equity, which is like a tremendous, um, value of our health department and something that we're now looking at all of our programming to figure out how we can use our preparedness programming to improve equity and outcomes throughout the healthcare system. Great, winding down, one last question, please. So you asked for a toolkit that had been evaluated. <laughs> so um, when Alonso Plow was the director of preparedness in LA, LA being one of the four cities that gets the FEP money, he was able to um, design a a study, basically, where in the eight regions of LA, they picked two communities or neighborhoods in each of those eight regions and sort of semi-randomized them so that one of the communities in a region got best of care standard and the other got a resiliency training for preparedness. And, and like Christy described, their vision was this could be resiliency to you know a hurricane or an earthquake, or it could be resiliency to everyday kind of stresses, economic crises, violence. Um, and so they, they worked with RAND and the UCLA and the health department. And uh, the Robert Johnson Foundation funded the evaluation because the FEP money could not fund evaluation. That was a <laughs> CDC restriction. Um, so that evaluation has been, um, different pieces of the evaluation have been, have been uh, published about what, what aspects of their toolkit worked and didn't work and how they refined them. And it'll be coming out in a website um, this summer. Um, but there are many articles, and they're in AJPH. Um, they're both the quantitative and the qualitative stories. Thank you. Great. Why don't you join me in well thanking our panelists today?